Welcome to Selling Secrets, the show about action movies and spy films. Our mission is to look at the movies we love and go behind the scenes of what makes a successful action film. Each episode, we'll take a deep dive into the filmmaking process, the marketing of Hollywood, and more. Do you know what it takes to make a Hollywood blockbuster successful? Let's find out together on Selling Secrets. Welcome to episode 4 of Selling Secrets. I'm your host, Josh Gay. This week, we're looking at the DC Fandom Livestream event. You might be asking, what is the DC Fandom event? Well, basically, it's Warner Media and DC Comics Virtual Fanboy Conference. Now in its second year of running, the online showcase, which was held on Saturday the 16th of October, dropped a multitude of fresh product from Warner Bros. DC label, including the new Batman movie trailer, sneak peeks at The Flash, Black Adam and Aquaman 2, among other teasers across the film, TV, gaming and comic book world. Let's stop there a second and go back to 2020 and look at how the DC Fandom event came to be. Essentially, it was a big experiment by Warner Media to see if DC Comics fans would congregate virtually for what amounted to an eight-hour string of programming about DC's movies, TV, and video games. When speaking with Variety, Chief Marketing Officer and TV Group President Lisa Gregorian said that they really wanted to put together an event that would super serve the fan base. No pun intended, obviously. And it would appear that that experiment by Warner Media and DC was a resounding success. According to the studio, the DC Fandom Hall of Heroes event in 2020 garnered 22 million views across 220 countries and territories over its 24-hour run via its in-house player, live streams by comic book influencers, and other content generated by fans watching the event. The idea of the Fandom event was born out of necessity. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, conventions such as E3 and Comic-Con were cancelled So the studio knew that the traditional methods of fan outreach would not be happening for the foreseeable future. According to Blair Rich, president of Worldwide Marketing for Warner Brothers Pictures, they wanted to fill that gap that the traditional conventions had left, and they really wanted to put the fans at the centre of an experience that could be dynamic and meaningful to them. So the marketing teams at DC and Warner Brothers put their heads together to come up with a way of recreating a fan convention, but on a virtual stage. The team quickly resolved to make the event global, broadcasting in nine languages and streaming for over 24 hours to allow all audiences a chance to watch at a reasonable time. And with video chat platforms such as Zoom becoming the new norm for the way people communicated, DC knew that people would engage with an online event, but they wanted to make it dynamic, engaging, and as fun as possible for their fans. They even went as far as to ship out special kits to the hosts and panellists who were appearing on the stream. These kits included things like a green screen and instructions on how to shoot their segments capturing their full bodies so that it could look like they were standing together on the Virtual Hall of Heroes stage that DC had designed. That way, they would avoid the event looking like a stereotypical Zoom conference call and be more dynamic to watch. As a result, the first ever DC fandom was a resounding success reaching over 22 million viewers, there was no possible way that a traditional physical style event could have ever matched the DC fandom's global reach. Now, let's come back to the present day in 2021 for the second ever DC fandom event. One year later, the event managed to rack up 66 million global views 
compared to the previous year's 22 million views worldwide. That's three times the viewership compared to the previous year's event. The second annual conference was available in more than 220 countries, in 12 languages, and in more than 50 live streams across social media platforms. Several hundred media outlets also rebroadcasted the stream. Warner Media reported that the social sentiment was overwhelmingly positive towards the second DC fandom, with it trending as number one on Twitter for eight hours in the US. DC fandom also trended in the top 50 in 53 countries around the world on Twitter. When speaking with Deadline, Anne Sarnoff, the chair and CEO of Warner Media Studios and Networks, said that with triple the fan traffic of last year, DC Fandom 2021 exceeded all of our expectations. We continue to innovate across the company in service of our fans, and I cannot overstate the creativity and hard work that went into this highly curated global digital event. We gave fans what they wanted, the very best of all things DC, and their engagement and response has been fantastic. We're as excited as they are to deliver on all great content that the DC fandom highlighted. So in Warner's own words, and by the numbers, the 2021 DC fandom was a resounding success. So how did the 2021 fandom event triple its viewership compared to the previous year? Well, one of the reasons is that it had a shorter runtime. In 2020, the stream lasted for roughly 8 hours. In 2021, it was half that length, running at about 4 hours in length. This shorter runtime made for a more engaging experience for the general viewer who didn't want to sit through hours and hours of content. Most people show up to these events to see one thing, and that's the trailers for the upcoming movies, games, and TV shows. So by cutting the running length and having less in-depth panels, this made for a much easier watching experience for the general fans who aren't necessarily super fans of the DC universe. So let's take a bit more of an in-depth look at the actual event itself. DC made a big push with their feature film slate this time around compared to the previous year. With two films shooting, one completing production, and two in pre-production, there was a lot to talk about, even if only the Batman had a proper trailer to unveil during the event. Fandom began with a look at Black Adam, featuring a scene of the title character played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson being awakened from millennia of slumber by an archaeologist and her team of explorers. The bullets start flying quickly, and it was an exciting way to open up the event. They then moved on to Aquaman and the Last Kingdom. This offered some behind-the-scenes footage and a first look at villain Black Manta's upgraded costume. Shazam 2 Fury of the Gods also unveiled a behind-the-scenes sizzle reel, with the film's main stars confirming the end of principal photography. The film sees Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu portraying goddesses arriving in Philadelphia to tangle with the Shazam family, who we met in the first film. We then got some very short sneak peeks, with the main stars of the upcoming Batgirl and Blue Beetle movies offering the briefest of teasers, including things like the design art of the title character's respective costumes, and a broad sense of what the films will be. We also got a short tease for the one animated feature on DC's roster, The League of Super Pets which sees Dwayne The Rock Johnson giving voice to a super character alongside Kevin Hart, Kate McKinnon, John Krasinski, and many more top-tier names. We then got a short look at the upcoming Flash movie, starring Ezra Miller in the title role. This film has been in long development and has missed half a dozen release dates at this point, but I'm really excited to see what they do with this one, and I was especially excited by the tease of Michael Keaton's Batman reprising his role for this film. The event then moved into the HBO Max side of things. If there's one thing that this year's fandom made clear, it's that HBO Max is the new hub for DC's expansive multiverse. Beyond Batgirl and Blue Beetle's eventual debuts on HBO Max, Pennyworth, 
which was previously an Epix exclusive, will be moving to Max for its third season late in 2022. Additionally, most of the DC Universe shows that HBO Max has taken on, such as Titans, Doom Patrol, and Harley Quinn, will return for their next seasons in 2022. But the big talking point for HBO Max was the release of James Gunn and John Cena's Peacemaker, which unveiled a teaser trailer and some behind-the-scenes footage of the filming of the show. One really interesting piece of content coming to HBO Max, which isn't necessarily a superhero show, will be DMZ, which is a four-part limited series based on a comic published by DC's now-defunct Vertigo imprint, written by Robert Patino, and is about the Second US Civil War, which takes place sometime in the future. We also got some looks at DC's other TV series, including Batwoman, Naomi, and The Flash, which, to be honest, none of them really tickled my fancy. They all look like the stereotypical CW shows that we've come to expect from the DC universe. We then move on to the video games that are coming out, with Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League and Gotham Knights both coming out in 2022, we got more cinematic trailers for them. They both look like fun games, but probably something that I won't rush to get on the day of release. Now, it's time to go into the section of Selling Secrets where we analyse a movie trailer. And seeing as we're looking at the DC Fandome, the biggest trailer release coming out of that event was for The Batman. So let's check it out together now. Wow, I am absolutely hyped for this movie. From the moment that trailer started when I was watching the DC Fandome event live, I had shivers running down my spine. 
in the trailer, we got a really good idea of what to expect from the film. In it, we saw the Riddler, played by Paul Dano, taken into custody by the Gotham City Police. But that seems to have little effect on his master plan, which involves the Batman, played by Robert Pattinson, Selina Kyle, played by Zoe Kravitz, and local mobster Oswald Cobblepot, aka The Penguin, played by Colin Farrell, who I still cannot believe that's him under all those prosthetics. They've done an incredible job with that. The film looks like everything I've wanted from a Batman movie. It has the theatrics of Tim Burton's Batman, but with the grounded, more gritty approach of Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. The film's director, Matt Reeves, says that it's a year two story of Batman, so thankfully, we won't be getting another reenactment of Bruce Wayne's parents being killed. We've seen that enough, and I'm really happy that we don't need to go through that again. By now, we all know how Bruce Wayne became Batman. Reeves also said that in the film, Bruce Wayne isn't really Bruce Wayne. He hasn't found his playboy style yet. He's very much just the Batman. He's angry, and we can really see that in the tone of this trailer. You see him beating up the thugs with the Joker masks, taking the bullets head on. He's just an absolute force to be reckoned with, and it, I don't think it's something that we've seen in a Batman film before. You know, we've always seen that duality of personality between Bruce Wayne and Batman, but we haven't seen the true way of how he molded himself to that more playboy personality from the angry man who just wants to get out there and stop the crime in Gotham City. And even though Reeves referred to the plot as an original story for the Batman, from the moment he began answering questions about the film, the number of villains and supporting characters in the cast, many of us fans thought, you know what, he's probably taking inspiration from Batman The Long Halloween, which is set in year two or after the events of Batman Year One storyline, where he's attempting to find out the identity of a serial killer known only as Holiday. It also chronicles the year that the mobsters lost control of Gotham City to the costumed supervillains. So I think we're in for a really rich story that pays homage to the DC Comics source material and moves away from the Zack Snyder style where everything was trying to lead it all into the Batman v Superman and Justice League side of things. We're getting a more pared back Batman detective crime story, and I'm so excited for that. So there we go. We've reached the end of episode four of Selling Secrets. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned a little bit more about the marketing that goes behind big events like the DC fandom. Let me know on social media what you thought of this episode and what you thought of the DC fandom, if you've watched it, or even the Batman trailer. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can find us on Instagram at Selling Secrets Pod, and you can find me at 007 Oz or 007 AUS on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Josh Gay. And I'll see you in two weeks' time for the next episode of Selling Secrets. Thank you.